Hello and welcome to the RAST Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. Hugh, thanks for joining me on the show, mate. Thanks for having me on. We're going to talk about the US market. We're going to talk about technology, ETFs, basically all the fun stuff in one thing, uh, which is this episode of the podcast. Um, but maybe to just jump straight into the meat of the sandwich, um, I want to ask you for an example of a company that kind of captures the imagination of where maybe AI technology um, mm. and kind of like the, the future of what we think about when it comes to what these companies can achieve. What would be an example of a company that springs to mind? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Owen. I mean, there's a lot of uh, interesting developments in AI already. Um, I mean, one interesting example is a company called uh, Intuitive Surgical. So imagine you're a patient, um, you know, you you have maybe prostate cancer or a broken hernia. Um, you walk into a studio, but you don't see any doctors around. What you actually see is a um, set of robot robotic arms or sensors on the side um, of the bed. And you're sitting there and the surgeon is actually outside of the room controlling that uh, device. So, um, you know, the intuitive surgical, they have a device called the Da Vinci uh, surgical system. It's currently in place now and they do do surgery on things like as uh, prostate cancer and, and hernia replacement. So that's a really interesting uh, development that we've seen in the field already. Um, and I'm pretty excited about what AI holds for the future because if this is in place now, imagine what we'll see in five, ten years later. So, mm. uh, yeah, some interesting examples there. Yeah, I think that's a great one. I think it illustrates it. It's it's a little. It's kind of like whenever the AI conversation gets brought up, it's like a little bit freaky and a little bit scary because <laughs> yeah. imagine all those yeah. arms. But I'm just imagining like a sci-fi movie. Yeah. Uh, and like you said, this is a business that has been around for many, many, many years, and it's currently in use around the world. So, um, really interesting to see where that could go. Mate, we usually start with a few icebreakers, given this is your first time on the show. Um, one of the questions that I've been asking recently is, mm. is what is the most recent investment that you have made? Yeah, so oh, my one's slightly different. Uh, you know, I think other people might say a stock or, or an ETF or something like that. Uh, for me, actually, the most recent investment I made was a book. Um, I think books are crucial to, you know, expanding your knowledge within a certain field. And obviously for me, AI and technology is one of those fields and, uh, and industries that really excites me. So that book is called Chip War uh, by Chris Miller. So maybe some of you have read it. It's actually one of the top business books uh, ranked by the FT. Uh, the reason why I like it is because, you know, it really encapsulates the AI and semiconductor industry um, across multiple chapters. It introduces, you know, the history of TSMC, AMD, and even NVIDIA, how they rose to the ranks to where they are now, because it wasn't just overnight their story in NVIDIA. They actually invested heavily um, over the past decade to get to where they are now. So that really opened my eyes as to what the dynamics look like between those different players within the industry. But um, yeah, I mean, books, uh, I think I, I love reading and I think it's, you know, critically important, uh, you know, if you ever wanted to learn what's happening uh, in different industries. So Chip War uh, was probably the most recent investment I made. I love it. Good. You're the first person that's taken it in a different direction. <laughs> um, this next question, uh, Cameron uh, Gleason, uh, your colleague said that uh, he had bought some mining stock, which I cannot remember the name of this thing. Um, so I'm going to ask you the question. So if that was the most recent, you bought a book. Mm. I'm curious, maybe it could be a book actually. What was your first investment? My first investment was actually a stock. Uh, okay. so I do have a stock story. And that is uh, that was A2 Milk. So I bought A2 Milk uh, as a uni student back in 2018. Um, the why I bought it, you know, there wasn't real any, there wasn't a really strong uh, structural investment thesis behind it. You know, I saw, you know, strong momentum uh, within the stock. It was kind of grinding up higher in 2018. Um, Australian exports of milk to China were uh, increasing rapidly and there were some defects in Chinese milk uh, supplies mm -hmm. within the supply chain. So that was a huge catalyst for AT Milk. Um, you know, I didn't do any sort of uh 
fundamental <laughs> due diligence or whatnot, but I, I saw a lot of positive headlines on the stock. So that rallied quite nicely into 2019. And I think I bought the stock at around, you know, eight to ten dollars and it went subsequently to about, you know, twelve to thirteen. So mm. it was a nice sort of profit. I didn't time it. Um I actually had to go on a holiday in 2019. So I decided to sell my position in A2 Milk, but it worked out nicely. But obviously over the years, um <laughs> that stock has come down uh quite a bit. So um yeah, A2 Milk mm. uh was my that's a good one. stock. Yeah. I actually actually um that's actually a good first first foray into the market because I find yeah. if it's if if you get on this kind of roller coaster and you happen to go straight up, people then get really overconfident uh, in investing and they have different perceptions about what it is. And if it goes straight down, typically people yeah. walk away from the stock market and think it's gambling. But if there's like this happy middle ground where it's enough to keep you in the game, you're interested, yeah. Yeah. you feel good about it. I think that's the perfect starting point. So well exactly done, mate. Right, yeah. um, okay, third icebreaker, which is who is the person that has had the biggest influence on mm. your investment approach, journey, philosophy, the way you see investing? Sure. Maybe I'll start with the second part of that question, like how I see investing, what my investment approach is like. Um, you know, I think that, well, I take the approach of simplicity. You know, simplicity is key in investing. I think that, uh, you know, it's one reason why I joined the ETF industry. I think that there are a lot of um, high quality um, funds that you can get at a fraction of the cost compared to active managers. Um, my philosophy is based around calculated risks. I think that where you see opportunities in market and you have an appropriate risk budget to take on, then you know don't be afraid to put where your money where you know you see that opportunity essentially. But at the same time, you can't be speculative with it. You need to have a strong uh, thesis behind what you're doing. Um, and then coming back to the first part of your question, who uh, you know, I think it's really my my parents. Uh, I say that because uh, my parents are quite different in their approaches to money. So my mom is very uh, careful, stringent, uh, very budget tight. So every dollar she would make sure uh, that's saved. So that's, I guess, given me the value side of my investment approach in ensuring that I don't go above and beyond what my tolerance for risk is. But then my dad, you know, he's actually an entrepreneur. He has his own right. business. He isn't afraid to borrow money from the bank and invest in you know, buying more stock, expanding into different geographies. So, um, you know, that side of things, that's where I get my calculated risk approach. You know, I'm not afraid to, you know, uh, put money where I see, um, you know, opportunities uh, in the market. You know, for example, I actually played, um, uh, you know, with some options uh, during the COVID crash and, uh, you know, it was quite risky, but I had a very strong thesis uh, to, to do that. Mm. Trade. So, yeah, my parents... I uh, really honed my investment philosophy and approach. That's great. Um, you, you, it's good that you can take that from both of your parents. Like on the one <laughs> yeah. hand, um, the more conservative, budget-aware type um, personality and values, but also then knowing when to take risk. I think mm. the key point that you mentioned there is calculated risk when it comes yeah. to investing. Um, a lot of people can't calculate risk here, like in a spreadsheet, but they kind of have an intuitive feel of where. Mm. They are doing something that's risky. Like obviously people would know for a credit card, it's going to be more risky. That's a more riskier thing to do with budgeting, for example, or when it's investing, an individual stock would be more risky than an ETF or something like this, you know, and they kind of get a feel for where things are, at least I hope. Um, before we dive into ETFs and um, talk about investing, generally speaking, um, I just want to go back in time a little bit and just understand a little bit more about yourself. Um, I've obviously gone online, seen some of the stuff that you've done, looked at your LinkedIn profile, gone back in time and tried to understand a bit more about you and how you got here. But I'm curious and listeners will be curious before we dive into things, just mm. how you got into investing. Yeah. So, um, I was a very big fanatic of um, economics back in high school. Um, I did economics in year 11 and 12. And for some reason, uh, I was very fascinated about what was happening in the world, whether it be politics or um, you know economics around different regions. Uh, I'm not sure where that sort of interest came from. I think you know some of my peers had interest in economics, and and so I developed a um, a group of people who you know shared that that vanity uh, for social sciences. And so um, yes, year 11, 12, I really developed my interest in um, uh, economics. But then in uni, transitioning into that, I went to um, 
UNSW, I did a bachelor's of, of commerce and economics degree. Uh, I chose commerce, you know, really because my dad, uh, as I said before, he's a, a business owner and uh, it just kind of makes sense to do business. So I kind of fell into uh, commerce and economics. But then transitioning into funds management and investing, um, you know, I really view finance and economics, that combination together, that's really where you get investing from. Um, you know, you really need to understand the micro components of a business, you know, their balance sheets, their income statements and whatnot. But at the same time, you know, these businesses, they operate, they don't operate in a vacuum. They operate in a, a wider society, you know, across different geographies and regions. So um, for me to be able to uh, continue uh, implementing and learning about economics, but also analyzing the details of a business's balance sheet. Together, that's how I fell into investing. And so, you know, transitioning forward, uh, you know, I had a few experiences at, at, at Pinnacle Investment Management uh, as a salesperson, um, and then I moved on to Lonsec uh, as a manager research analyst as well. Um, and so along the way, um, I also studied for my CFA uh, sort of qualification. Again, um, I was just really excited about the industry and just getting that qualification that just would put a stamp um, on my name. And so, um, yeah, that's where I am now uh, at yeah. Peter's as an investment strategist. Yeah, it's uh, it's no mean feat that uh, CFA um, program, the three exams <laughs> for folks that don't know, um, it's considered probably in combination, those three exams are considered in the top three hardest um, exams of any profession in the world. Um, so, Kudos and full respect to you, mate. I know it's. I know how hard it is. Um, yeah. All those hundreds, of, if not thousands, of hours of study yeah. um, for those exams. So well done to you, mate. Um, today we're going to be talking about ETFs. We're going to be talking about AI technology. Um, I say AI and technology. They're like two separate things, but they're kind of under the. If you think about it, under mm -hmm. the tent of technology is this field of AI, and it's growing rapidly, and it's what everyone wants to know about. Um, when I catch up with older people, they're fascinated by it. You know. They see people on their mobile phones when they're sitting on the tram or the train and they think, you know, everyone's dialed into something. Um, and then you look at, you know, younger people and the tools that they're experiencing and what they're going to go into the world with in terms of their working careers. Uh, and then there's everything, everyone in between that's, you know, business owners that's working for someone or something that may use one of these tools in their business for productivity or in a corporate organization for efficiency. So there's so many opportunities here beyond yeah. just what, maybe any one individual has an interaction with. But given that your role is all about this, and like you said, you're reading books about it, you kind of eat, sleep, and breathe this, um, I'm curious if you could identify for all of us listening, maybe say a couple of companies, a few companies that you can think of that are really leading the charge in terms of this disruption right now. Sure. I think that uh, there's there's probably two main companies on my mind. Uh, the first one I'm sure most people know is uh, OpenAI. Uh, OpenAI, for those that don't know, they uh, have um, launched uh, ChatGPT, which is a sort of chatbot assistant that most people can use. Which it's free to use online. Um, they launched in 2022. And the reason why I choose uh, OpenAI as probably one of the most disruptive companies is because you know, without the launch of ChatGPT, I don't think the world would have realized how a powerful AI is. I don't think that um, they would uh, realize the productivity increases are so substantial um, from, uh, um, you know, a large language model like ChatGPT. So um, if you think about when they launched, which was in 2022, that's actually less than two years ago. And so there is such a huge runway for uh, that technology to really increase in uh, computing capacity. If we think about different uh, technological trends that have happened throughout decades, we've had you know cars, we've had smartphones, we've had the internet example, for example. I think we're at the start of a new you know shift uh, in technological innovation, and mm -hmm. I think that we just all should be very grateful um, because we get to see the uh, beginnings of. Um, AI really taking off. Um, for me personally, I use OpenAI. Uh, there's also other smaller venture capital firms as well uh, that have similar tools like Anthropics, Claude, um, and also Perplexity as well. They're, they're sort of different in the sense that they have, uh, they might specialize in different 
uh, you know, text uh, language processing and whatnot. You know, for perplexity, I might use that for uh, more uh, searches that are a bit more nuanced than what Google can provide you. And then for OpenAI, I might use that for uh, questions on programming and Excel. Uh, so yeah, th there's different sort of mm -hmm. tools that you can use um, uh, these different chatbots for. Uh, and then the second company, uh, everyone's aware of it, is uh, NVIDIA. Um, again, I bring NVIDIA because if you think about NVIDIA compared to Cisco back in the 1998 to 2000.com uh, bubble, um, Cisco was really viewed as the enabler of the internet revolution. For those who don't know Cisco, um, they essentially provide the infrastructure network, the routers, the switches in order for internet to be used. And because the internet was being seen as the next dynamic shift in innovation during the 2000s, Cisco was viewed as the biggest beneficiary of that trend. And so their stock price increased rapidly all the way during the 2000s, but subsequently crashed about 89%. And it wasn't only, it was only until late 2021 until the stock recovered. So NVIDIA, it's so disruptive. Why? It's because they're being viewed as the enabler of not the internet revolution, but now the AI revolution. Their advanced GPUs, they're so essential for all the hyperscalers, Microsoft, Meta, Google, in order to build their large language models. And currently they have you know, around 90% market share in the data center GPU uh, market. So they've become so critical. But uh, coming back to my earlier point, this wasn't just overnight. I think the market saw this narrative overnight, but they've actually been investing heavily across the past decade in their software uh, which is CUDA, and CUDA is essentially a very a standard programming language. Anyone on the street can program on their GPUs, not just graphics experts. So the breadth of applications that can be used for NVIDIA's chips, uh, it's so wide compared to other players like AMD and Intel. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, to answer your question, so OpenAI and NVIDIA, uh, they probably have been the most disruptive companies um, so far in in the in recent years, it's it's really you've probably given me, given us the best kind of explanation of how those two have come into existence. Mm. Um, the thing that when OpenAI hit the hit the scenes, everyone was like, "How can I invest in this? How can I invest in yeah. this?" Yeah, yeah. And basically, the because it's still a private organization, effectively, mm. as far as I'm aware, Hugh, the best way to get that exposure, if you like, is through Microsoft. But yeah because they're a shareholder in it, but Microsoft is a huge behemoth that obviously has a lot of other things going on, like their cloud computing, their, yeah. they, own, they own Xbox, they own, you know, Windows and all those other things that come mm. with Microsoft. Um, but that's really interesting. And obviously, NVIDIA, we've seen NVIDIA just rocket off yeah. um, into the clouds in terms of its share price. Yeah, I mean, just to your point on like how to access OpenAI, mm. yeah, I mean, Microsoft is one way, but um, not too long ago, uh, OpenAI and Apple actually announced an agreement between the two for um, OpenAI to have their sort of um, um, AI models incorporated into Apple devices. So um, I think from iPhone 15 uh, models to 16 plus, uh, which will be released later this year, um, you'll actually be able to utilize the capabilities of OpenAI's technology. Um, in terms of the profit share agreement between the two, um, they haven't gone into the details of how they'll split it. I think for now it's around 50-50, but um, you know, Apple might be uh, a sensible play if you wanted exposure to OpenAI's um, the, uh, growth, which has really uh, grown exponentially over the past uh, mm. few years. But, uh, you know, I'm excited. I think I'll upgrade my iPhone uh, probably next year. Uh, I have an iPhone 11, so it's time to refresh that uh, <laughs> device into the new AI-powered uh, uh, phone. So, yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know if, if you've seen them or not, but we've seen like a lot of the Samsung ads now coming out and it's all about the Gemini, Gemini uh, kind of enablement. Um, there's a new ad running on on wherever you get your media at the moment and it's yeah. effectively showing that like there's this young mm. guy that's skating um and he's in different countries and he doesn't speak the language instead he has his his galaxy <laughs> phone that translates yeah. into spanish or yeah. to portuguese or to chinese or whatever the case may be um he's 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 able to use that through ai and yeah, I think okay. as um 
companies like Apple kind of leverage that. That's that's really interesting. And a lot of people don't know this. I know you would know this, but um, like when you go into your Apple, your iPhone and you search for something, it defaults mm. to Google search. And that's been a big thing for decades about how much does Apple actually pay Google yeah, and yeah. Um, to use its search engine within the the phone, or you know these types of things, and um, who actually benefits in that relationship? It's really interesting. Mm. So maybe maybe Apple does that too, and I'm I'm kind of excited by that. But obviously, like you and I, um, we talk a lot about ETFs, mate. We talk about um, you know all different types of ETFs, um, whether they're index, whether they're thematic based, and or sector based. Um, but Obviously, like people will know, and we'll come to this in a minute, but people will know beta shares. And I don't know if it's the most popular ETF that beta shares has, but the NDQ ETF, which is NASDAQ 100. And there are mm. so many other ETFs we've spoken about on the show before. How, like, how can investors, let's just start at the top, like, how can investors that prefer to use ETFs for all the sensible reasons we've laid out before get exposure to these types of trends or companies? Sure. Yeah. That's a really great question. I think that. Uh, what we've seen in the ETF industry is an explosion of new uh, ETF launches. And, you know, investors are probably just so, um, there's just so many different funds, they don't know where to start. Uh, but we have a, a few funds that uh, have exposure to these companies that we've talked about. So uh, the NASDAQ 100 fund or mm -hmm. is a fund that we have, the ticker is NDQ. Uh, so it tracks the NASDAQ 100 Um uh, index and the Nasdaq 100 has typically a, a heavier weighting to the US IT and technology sector. So uh, those magnificent seven companies that we talked about, there's quite a big weight um, within that uh, ETF. But to your point about uh, you know Apple using Google as a default search function and who's paying what, I think that's where the um, power of an ETF comes in because you're really holding a diversified portfolio of different companies within that structure. Um, so whether Apple wins or Google wins or Meta wins, um, you know, it does, we, we're not too sure, right? It, it's very hard to determine yeah. that on a stock specific level. But what we do know is that um, at a sector level, this whole sector is benefiting. And so by holding a portfolio of these companies, as in NASDAQ 100, um, you're really getting um, a nice diversified exposure to that theme. But there's a few other ETFs um, I wanted to talk about as well. I think people uh, may not recognize the investment opportunities beyond um, NVIDIA and the Magnificent Seven. Let's think about the supply chain uh, of the semiconductor chip industry. You know, for NVIDIA's chip, it someone has to make it. And that someone is a uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company or TSMC. Um, the reason why they're so important is because they have over 90% market share in the advanced chip manufacturing space. So think about a company, whether it's uh, AMD, Intel, NVIDIA as probably the top three uh, designers of advanced GPUs, that all goes to TSMC. And why? It's because they have two things. You know, the first thing is that they have these specific nodes. So a node or they have seven, five, and three nanometer nodes. A node is essentially think about the width of the silicon chip uh, that a laptop or a iPhone uses. Uh, you can't stray away from that configuration. So uh, these designers are really beholden to TSMC's technology. And on the second point, uh, TSMC has a breadth of expertise in their manufacturing processes. They've been around for decades. All they do is manufacturing. Um, they got to this point where they've developed these AI chips, not just because they started off with it. They actually started off by making the uh, chips for iPhones, which they still do. But that's how they gravitated towards, I guess, uh, not low value, but sort of uh, medium value uh, mm. work to high value work in high performance computing chips. So, um, you know, TSMC, they recently announced their earnings and now over half of their earnings goes to high performance chips and a third goes to smartphones. Uh, you know, a few other companies uh, are Samsung and SK Hynix. Uh, they are memory chip providers. So, um, in order for um, you to store data in your large language model, you need more memory and more storage. And Samsung and SK Hynix provide that exposure. So uh, coming back to the question on ETFs, we have an ETF called Asia. Asia is our BetaShares Asia Technology Tigers Fund. The 
ticker is ASIA or Asia, um, and it has exposure to those companies, um, TSMC, Samsung, and SK Hynix. And a few hmm. other examples of ETFs we have um, is the uh, Hack ETF, which is our global cybersecurity ETF. There are a few companies in there that utilize AI software um, to uh, detect any malware uh, that a system might uh, receive. So CrowdStrike, I'm sure. I was going to say. Yeah, really most people example. are aware of that. Yep, is one. And then Palo Alto as well um, is, is another example. They've been using AI within their business models as well. And then lastly, we have another fund, RBTZ. So RBTZ is our global robotics and automation fund. Um, so again, that has exposure to companies where um, they're using AI, but more so in the um, industrial robotics side of things. So Intuitive Surgical was one example. That's a company within RBTZ. Mm -hmm. So they you know, have that Da Vinci surgical system. Uh, there's also another company like Kiens. You know, Kiens has, um, think about a, a manufacturing uh, a plant where they're making cars and at the last stage of the production process, they need to do a quality check uh, to ensure that those pieces are not faulty. So that increases the yield and quality of the cars. Um, and so companies like that are in a ETF like RBTZ. So just to wrap it up, you know, we've got NDQ, mm -hmm. Asia, Hack and RBTZ as a few funds that offer exposure to AI. I was going to ask you about Asia in a, in a moment. So we'll, we'll wait yeah, that. but um, isn't it funny with CrowdStrike? Like with, so everyone that used Microsoft devices, people realize Microsoft using CrowdStrike as a backbone to its infrastructure and security, and one of those probably most people hadn't heard of CrowdStrike. You and I would have from years ago, but most people wouldn't have known that those existed. And then all of a sudden, something goes <laughs> yeah. wrong, and then they're yeah. out in, in front of everything. And it just shows how globally connected we are, mm. and how vital those components are in the whole ecosystem. I think it's fair to say like some of those companies you just mentioned are probably the most important companies in the world, not just from a, you know, an investment backbone and technology enablement, but also like politically and geopolitically and defense wise, like um, most people would be aware of how critically important TSMC and its yeah. manufacturing process mm. is globally and how countries are kind of tr like jostling to try and control it. Um it is a. Uh, if you think, if you're listening to this and you think that the world of technology and AI is only going to grow, those companies are the companies that will have to fuel that in some way. Maybe not forever, but at least for the foreseeable future. So that's what makes them critically important. I've, I'm glad you brought up things like RBTZ, um, NDQ, NASDAQ 100, these types of ETFs. Um, why would someone, in your opinion, why would someone go with a thematic style play or a sector style play, like say hack, like it's a, like a kind of cybersecurity sector, which is in itself a theme um, versus say just like a blanket N NDQ, I've got the top 100 of the US. Like why would people do that? It's a really great question. Um, I think there's a, a couple reasons. Well, firstly, why you would use a thematic fund in the first place. I think that um, you would use a thematic fund uh, because you have a view that um, a certain structural theme will will take off. So, for example, AI is probably the the best example here. If you think that AI will take off as a thematic, um, then you might want to bolt on a thematic fund like RBTZ uh, or Hack onto your portfolios to add some return that uh, will give you um, differentiated exposure to your Nasdaq 100. So, a really good example, if I might bring, is um, Hack and. Uh, Nasdaq 100. Um, the constituents within those ETFs are actually quite different. Uh, there is a you know heavier weighting to companies like CrowdStrike, Palo Alto, etc. Within Hack, and you know the analysis that we've done, it actually shows that Hack has experienced lower drawdowns and lower volatility than the Nasdaq 100. Hmm. And the reason why is because um, when you think of cybersecurity as a uh, industry within software. Um, CIOs uh, in the US, they were interviewed and they noted that security software or cybersecurity was one of the uh, areas that they would be least likely to cut their budgets on. Or in other words, uh, they will keep spending money ensuring that their data is well protected. So obviously that's benefited companies like um, CrowdStrike and Palo Alto. 
uh, the uh, consistency of their returns haven't been as variable compared to, say, companies within the NASDAQ 100. But, you know, on other thematics as well, like RPTZ, um, you know, it's really important to understand, um, again, these companies, they're not the same as the ones in your NASDAQ 100. And if you have the view that uh, there will be a strong structural change in things over the next three, five years, you can actually add a return enhancer to your portfolios that you wouldn't mm-hmm. expect by just holding a core ETF. Um, I think that ultimately thematics are fun, right? Um, thematics are fun because you get to um, ex- express a view on, on markets. You get to say, well, um, let's say everyone holds a NASDAQ 100 or A200 BGBL, for, uh, for example. But I think the fun comes in saying, well, do I think this trend will uh, continue? Do I think it's actually uh, going to be structural? And mm. that's where you can add incremental dollars into that portfolio. You know, for those listeners who may be new to investing, thematics, you know, generally should be a smaller part of your portfolio as opposed to your core holdings. Um, and so you won't be beholden to large capital losses if that structural thematic doesn't play out. Good point. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, you know, thematics in a nutshell. I love that you use that uh, perspective of like, well, what's actually inside the ETF. It's like, like I, I'm, I'm, what I'm going to be really curious about here is this idea of with CrowdStrike and the Microsoft system just basically like becoming a zero overnight, mm. how many companies and like how will that relationship actually change? Um, I'm actually going to watch that really closely over the next year because it could just be that Microsoft as like a the, the household name looks to CrowdStrike and goes, you guys stuffed up or whatever the case may have been, right? Yeah. This is this is a big, big problem, like a global outage. This is not good. But then they might look the other direction and go, oh, there's no one else we can use. So um, we got to keep spending or it's going to be too hard to change. Like, you know, all of these different things. And that will speak to that. I think that will illustrate your point very nicely, which is you need these systems. Like, sure, there might be big things like this that happen, but you need them. You need cybersecurity in your business. Like, I know for, for, for our business, like we've been so lucky that we use all of our infrastructure is cloud-based. Mm. And so we don't have to employ our own, you know, cybersecurity experts because that's all outsourced. But we would never be able to, like RASP wouldn't be able to yeah. exist and yeah. do what we do without that. So the, the thought of switching that off, no. Nah. And then the other thing you mentioned, of course, satellite, like the different ETF suite that you have. Um, obviously, like people are using NASDAQ, uh, 100, the NDQ ETF in the core. Some mm. would probably even use it as a return enhancer in their satellite as well. Um, so, you know, hack these types of things. And we'll come back to Asia in a minute. So we've we've talked pretty positively. I think it's fair to say, Hugh, about, you know, AI as a them- thematic, but maybe just structural thematics. I don't know if it's like how you think about that, but just generally like obviously AI as a division of this broader thing called software and technology. Um I'm curious, like, if you, if you take the other side of the kind of debate and you say, okay, I'm going to invert this, what are the risks that are present here? Like, the known risks, obviously. Um, like, what are they? Yeah, I think that, well, let's, take, let's think about what's made these companies so popular and why they become uh, the market darlings. Uh, earnings have really driven the performance of the Magnificent Seven stocks, mm-hmm. um, research and development as well. Um, they've been spending a lot of money in the past decade, and as a result, they've really reaped the benefits in terms of revenue and earnings. So um, if you think about what's made them good, then we know what's going to make them um, more susceptible to risk, and that's earnings, again. Uh, you know, any revisions or negative revisions to their earnings in this quarter, next quarter, et cetera, um, that will have a uh, negative sentiment um, across the sector, which might weigh across the industry. Um, you know, we're at a interesting inflection point where the um, growth rate of earnings of the uh, MAG7 stocks is slightly decreasing whilst the S&P 493 or the other 493 stocks in the S&P 500, they're actually seeing positive revisions to their earnings growth. So I think the figures were around you know 6% year on year for this quarter for the S&P 493. Um, and with the MAG7, uh, it's still actually growing quite strongly. You know, I think earnings are expected to grow 
about 26% year on year. But the the fact that it's decreasing, you know, the market doesn't like that fact. And so as a result, that might be a risk uh, to uh, those stocks. So earnings is one, but also we're at a, uh, you know, an in- interesting point in terms of, you know, geopolitics and political uncertainty. You know, we have an election coming up in um, November. There might be policies which might be uh, focused more on regulation and trying to break up big tech companies as well. Uh, you know, as to the certainty of those policies, you know, I'm not a political expert by any means, but there's uh, certainly a risk in uh, what those uh, might mean for the MAG7 stocks as well. Geopolitics is another example. Um, you know, the, there's been a few conflicts in the uh, Middle East between Israel and Hamas. Now, obviously, that's probably going to impact um, the real economy more so, so things like commodities, oil, gold, etc. But the reason why I bring that up is because um, what happens in uh, geopolitics, it weighs on sentiment and sentiment weighs on the stock market. As a result, even if it's not going to have a direct effect, you know, that might weigh down generally across the board, across these stocks. So, uh, yeah, there's a few things there. I think there's a uh, risk to earnings downgrades being harsher by the market. I think there's political uncertainty in terms of uh, policies, whether that's the Democratic or Republican Party in the US, uh, what that might mean uh, when the FTC or DOJ implements them. So that's the Fair Trade Commission and Department of Justice. And then there's general mm-hmm. geopolitics as well in the Middle East. You know, having said all that, um, we're actually right now in earnings season. Um, and a few companies have reported, Microsoft, Google, uh, Meta overnight reported as well. And Meta is up 7% in after-hour trading because they beat revenue expectations. So um, it doesn't seem like things are bad, you know. It, things are going well and these companies are still generating billions of dollars. So, uh, you know, I'm personally quite uh, optimistic about what the sector holds for us in the um, next few months. Mm, it's always one of those things where, People are waiting for something like uh, the amount of comments that we've had in our community of, uh, you know, can the US keep going higher and can it, you know, uh, people like it's at an all time high. It's at, and I'm, mm. Well, most of the time, if it's a good stock market, it will be close to an all time high. It may not be at the all time high, but typically over the long term, companies make more profits. So stock prices tend to go higher. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It may not be the, in the case any one year to the next, but over the long term, that tends to be the case. So. Most people are worried that it is at an all-time high most of the time. Um, and if you just look at, like you said, the fundamental drivers, like when we say fundamentals, we mean like the sales, the profits, the new products that come out, um, the new industries that are, are growing out of these types of things. Speaking of, I remember a few years ago when 3D printing was a big thing. I don't know if you ever, if you ever came across the 3D printer or not, Hugh, but um, I remember when they came out, some you know market commentators were saying that 3D printing, it's going to be the return of manufacturing to the United States or to Australia. Um, it's going to be like, it's going to like help reverse globalization. If that's a good thing, I don't know. But <laughs> like they, they kind of said these things because all of a sudden you could manufacture at home with just like a printer, like you could do this. And it didn't really happen, right? Mm-hmm. And so I guess one of the things that AI promises, and we've already seen this, is productivity enhancement. Like we've seen huge productivity enhancement to just even creating a PowerPoint slide. Right, like it's so much easier than ever before, or you know, replying to a friend with some sort of AI-enabled voice assistant or whatever. Do you see? um, Do you see AI having an impact beyond just productivity? And like, I guess this is more like the creative side of our brains we're going to be using here. But is there anything that you can see or you've come across? Yeah, so I I think right now everyone is viewing AI as the uh, productivity enabler. There's no question to it. We all know that, you know, tools like uh, ChatGPT, Copilot, et cetera, it's helping programmers program faster. It's helping us search more and create charts faster, analyze data faster as well. So productivity uh, isn't a question. I think what AI can also enable is, you know, something on uh, the revenue side or optimizing revenues. I think that right now the industry is probably focused on what are the cost cutting um, features we can get out from AI. But um, I think ultimately AI will be the uh, biggest economic driver for most economies around the world. Um, so, you know, when I think, when I say revenues, you know, think about a, uh, 
a small online business using Facebook's platform. So Facebook Marketplace is a good example. Um, if Microsoft or Meta, uh, sorry, if Facebook or Meta are using uh, AI tools within their models and that becomes more optimized and enhanced, it really empowers small businesses and also individuals as well to gain data as to, you know, Who's going to be the best buyer for me? What's going to be the best price for the um, certain product that I'm selling? So I think that revenue optimization is probably one area that um, will be beneficial or an outcome of uh, this whole AI thematic. So uh, hmm. beyond productivity, revenue is is one aspect uh, that I see. Yeah, that's really interesting because I like that you use that example. I was actually chatting to some small business owners yesterday and they use WooCommerce, like a WordPress tool. Mm. Um, WooCommerce is like an online store. So people know Shopify or they've come across the shop logo. But the other big one is WooCommerce. And people will probably tend to uh, underestimate this. But if you have an e-commerce store and you have like a thousand different products that you sell, which is pretty common for some businesses, someone actually has to go in and like put in a description of the product. Make sure the stock levels are up to date yeah. and all this stuff. There's a new AI tool that's come out uh, and it's like already in built and you can just click a button and it automatically optimizes all the text, all the descriptions, all the specifications <laughs> in one go. Like exactly it's crazy. Right, yeah. And that's sure that's a productivity enhancer, but it's also means that all the products are optimized for SEO. The web store looks better yeah. and that's a revenue enhancer too. So I'm really, that's a really good, good distinction. Mm. Um, I've got two more questions for you uh, on this kind of general theme, which is, um, if you were just, and this might be like a quick answer from you, like I'm, it may be like what you've already mentioned, but if you had to identify just a couple of things that people listening to this that are a bit overwhelmed by technology, but know it's a big thing, this whole AI revolution type thing, if you could pick like a couple of those general technologies or themes that people should focus on, what would they be? Yeah, I mean, it's it's such a broad thing. I mean, I think uh, fundamentally, um, if I think about who the main players are, it's probably the uh, a safe bet to like start with those. So think of companies like the the Metas, the Microsofts, the Googles. Um, you know, these are companies that everyone is familiar with. Everyone has a, an Apple iPhone. Everyone uses uh, the Windows operating system uh, or uses Facebook or YouTube. So, you know, at the same time, these companies are generating billions of dollars. So it's a really safe place to start. You know, it's very unlikely these companies will go bankrupt overnight. And so, uh, you know, as I said, NASDAQ 100 is is a good place that holds companies within that theme. I think also uh, we talked about TSMC and companies upstream in the supply chain. Again, they're not going to disappear. They're often known as what we call the picks and shovels of the AI trend um, in markets mm -hmm. because they are essentially providing the ingredients in order to make GPUs. So I think that, you know, companies like TSMC, Samsung, SK Hynix, and then those MAG7 companies, so Asia and NDQ, like these are really core ETFs that will, um, you know, really have structural tailwinds behind it over the next few years. You know, I think uh, other thematic players like RBTZ and Hack, yes, that will definitely be there um, as well. Uh, they're not as close to what we call this um, AI infrastructure story that we're seeing, but they're definitely benefiting directly in their own rights um, in robotics, automation, and cybersecurity. But if you wanted to get, you know, to the heart of this story and this AI thematic, the build out of uh, GPUs, data centers, and chatbots, like it really makes sense to start with. Well, who's providing it? It's the mm -hmm. Mag 7. And then who's supplying the chips? Well, it's companies in Asia. It's TSMC, Samsung, and SK Hynix as well. So, yes, there's there's a breadth of products out there. Uh, personally, for, for me, it just makes sense to start with, well, yeah, who's starting mm -hmm. all this? It's really companies within those two baskets. Speaking of, let's switch um, quickly to that other gear, which is in the other bucket, which is um, Asia. A lot of people know the big US names because we use a product like Apple iPhone here. I'm on a iMac when I'm recording this. We've got like Android is our TV and it connects to our speakers and all that sort of stuff, right? So people know those names. But people probably aren't as familiar with that the the companies that are doing similar or different or complementary things in Asia. And obviously you brought up the Asia ETF before, mm. um, which is a perfect illustration and a way to kind of capture exposure to these types of businesses. Can you talk about that? Like I asked Tom about this last year and he was it was really interesting what he had to say. Um, but I'm curious what you think about 
those types of businesses. I mean, I, in my notes, I've got names like Tencent, Alibaba. They do different things, but you've already mentioned some. So, yeah. like, where do they go from here? Yeah, it's a good question. So maybe I'll uh, I won't touch on TSMC, Samsung, SK, and Hynix uh, for now. We touched upon it earlier, but yes, um, Tencent and Alibaba are other top five holdings within Asia. Um, you know, they're not directly, um, you know. Um, in the AI infrastructure sort of bucket, um, but they're definitely leveraging off AI technologies. Um, interestingly, though, the sort of share price performance of Tencent and Alibaba um, haven't been the same this year. They actually have diverged quite significantly. Um, and the reason why is because of their business models. So Tencent, uh, you know, they have apps like WeChat. Uh, for those that, that don't know, it's a very popular um, sort of social media app that they use on their phones, but it's beyond social media. They can actually make payments on that phone. Mm. Um, and so any sort of charge that gets made on it, uh, Tencent can take a share of it. So they have a really nice diversified business model. You know, they also do gaming as well, sort of like games on um, Apple, Android, etc. They recently renewed, announced a new game called Dungeon Fighters. It raked in $270 million dollars in the first 30 days. And that's 30% of their business, which is huge for a company like Tencent. You've got fintech business um, advertising as well. So they're sort of spread out ac across nice different segments. And as a result, um, they haven't been subject to the same fluctuations like Alibaba have been. Um, and for um, Alibaba, for those that don't know, they're the one of the biggest e-commerce players in China. Um, about 80 to 90% of their business is within that space. Uh, we know what challenges China is facing at the moment in terms of you know, general economic growth. Sentiment has been quite negative as well. And so consumers there, uh, they're not spending as much. And if you're not spending as much, then obviously sales volumes that Alibaba receive won't be as high. And so the sales, um, you know, revenue growth for a company like Alibaba hasn't been as strong as that for Tencent. Um, but, you know, the AI theme is still there. You know, they are still implementing different ways they can enhance their business models. You know, Alibaba, you know, with a giant like uh, in e-commerce, you can really optimize, again, um, SEO searches, what products will do well, et cetera. Um, but yes, Tencent and Alibaba are two company examples. Um, I think that TSMC, Samsung, and SK Hynix on the supply chain side, again, will always remain there um, as well. And, mm -hmm. you know, with Samsung and SK Hynix, um, you know, I'm not sure if that's a, a, a stock or area that's been talked about much on the podcast, but um, for those that don't know, they're in the memory chip space. I think personally, memory is very important for the industry as well, because um, it's not just computing power. It's also about how much storage you can hold. So the industry is moving towards a um, new advanced area of memory called HBM memory, which is called high bandwidth memory. Essentially, it's just a new technology where you can stack up different chips, uh, memory chips on top of each other. So you will have eight memory chips. You stack it on top of a silicon wafer. And essentially, you will have a nice sort of 3D structure where you can really uh, hmm. maximize the amount of storage you have on a chip um, whilst, you know, maintaining the same level of compute capacity. So, you know, those companies are, are really interesting examples that um, I think most people don't know. Yeah. And obviously, when you compare like the US tech companies to the Asian tech companies, it's very different in terms of the valuations. And that's kind of like the, the balancing act that investors mm. can think about. It's like, well, yeah, sure, we all know about NVIDIA and these types of businesses, but you just mentioned businesses that no one really seems to talk about as much um and you obviously get there's a different valuation implied valuation that comes along with that so you kind of take the good with the bad and um that's what yeah. investing is right yeah. so um so i'll put all the links in the show notes to these things these etfs that you mentioned so people can go in and they can visit them on the bhs website pop the hood and say i see what's inside that i see what Hugh was talking yeah. about there and some of the really interesting companies and i just love that ETFs are fully transparent because you can do that. And I, I remember when ETFs came out and they, we started having these thematic ETFs. I used to go to them, Hugh, and then use them as ideas that I would then mm. pursue for further yeah. research to find out how did these ETF, how did these companies get in this ETF? What are they doing that's interesting? Why are they in there? Go and research them. And like you said, when an industry is fast moving, it's um it goes back to a book that I read ages ago called The Gorilla Game. Um, and it was the the basic premise is that you don't know who's going to be the gorilla and who's going to be a chimp 
in an industry. Obviously, we've already got some gorillas in the technology <laughs> industry, but um, as that in, in the early days of that industry, the easiest way to capture the essence of it, like you said, is to take that whole basket approach. And then if you want to then identify which companies are no longer chimps, they actually are going to be the gorilla and they're going to beat everyone else. And um, that's a really interesting way and a, approach that people can use. Final question here. This is your first time on the show and it's been an absolute delight, mate. Um, I usually ask the question, you might know this, um, that um, I would love for you to kind of have some self-reflection. It seems like you're the type of guy that does it anyway. But um, if you could go back in time and and tell yourself something, it could be about finance, it could be about life, business, could be like, don't read that book or read this one instead or whatever the case may be. Like, What's one thing that you would tell your younger self? Yeah, I think probably one thing I would tell myself is just to have fun with it. You know, investing is a um, it's a fun and rewarding journey. I think that too often people might be um, overly concerned about how much money to invest or which ETF is the best or uh, whatnot. But you know, I think just taking a step back and thinking, well, um, you get to sort of express a view in the market. You get to um, have a say as to what company. Uh, does well or not, you know, that's uh, really powerful. Um, I think it's uh, something that people should just generally take a step back and appreciate. Um, I think another thing is just reading more books as well. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, I love uh, my books and that, uh, you know, if I got to you know spend a bit more time uh, reading them in the past, I think that, you know, generally I'd be, you know, just a more appreciable of like different industries, different trends that's happening in markets. And it'll just give you more insights, uh, makes you more uh, a rich character or, or person. So mm. um, yeah, just just have fun with it, really. Uh, read more books. Um, and I think that generally, if you're just taking a nice diversified approach to investing to ETFs, um, you know, I'm sure we all know over the long run, um, wealth creation is um, very uh, paramount in, in investing and it's um, very likely that will happen over the long run um, mm. at least. So, yeah, just a, a few thoughts on, on my mind. Yeah, sensible long-term advice. And I think that's the trepidation that comes with putting your money on the line is, is real for some people. But if you do approach it in a way that's enjoyable, it's exciting, it's a learning experience. I think that's a far better way. And it kind of takes away some of the negative emotions that come with risking some money. You can start yeah. small, you can be inquisitive and curious about how all these things work. And you can look around the world around you and see, hey, well, actually, I've got a tiny little slither of Samsung, or I own a tiny bit of this ETF yeah. which owns Apple, you know. Um, and that's that's a really powerful lesson. Yeah. I mean, just one more thing. I would, I would say also just to keep things simple as well. Um, I think uh, too often, again, you can be uh, wrapped up in a, a small cap mining stock that you saw in hot copper or you're mm -hmm. doing intense due diligence, looking at their financial statements. Um, I think that, yeah, ultimately, um, investing isn't hard. I don't think it should be hard. I think that what we do here at BetaShares is that we try to enhance the uh, wealth creation journey of all Australians. You know, we have over a million different Australians that invest with us. And that's a huge stat to think about. Mm. Um, and that's a message we really want to try to get across to, um, you know, all sort of users out there, uh, particularly in Australia, that um, investing uh, shouldn't be too hard. It should be very simple. I think that taking, you know, just start off with, you know, again, uh, a core ETF, um, companies that you've heard of, as I said, my, Meta, Microsoft, Google, everyone knows these companies, everyone uses their devices, you know, stick with something that you're familiar with. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, if they've been around for decades of generating lots of cash, uh, you know, it's generally probably a safe bet to, to stick with. So yeah, just take a step back, keep it simple. Um, you know, you don't need to do the the crazy hours of, you know, financial mm. uh, due diligence and whatnot. Uh, maybe that's your thing. Maybe you do like analyzing stocks and you're, you want to become an equity analyst. Um, yeah, do that. But um, at the same time, yes, it, it doesn't have to be siloed for investment professionals. Um, investing is for everyone. That's the message. Yeah, I love it, mate. Great. And thank you for breaking that down. I honestly, I think that's the thing. Um, we're seeing that for the first time ever. Thanks to organizations mm -hmm. like BetaShares and ETFs, generally speaking, have democratized access, made it easier to reach overseas companies. I remember when I started my career, how hard it was just to open a US brokerage account from Australia. And now um, you don't need to. Um, it's so easy. 
So, um, mate, heaps of fun. Thanks for joining me. I hope this is the first part of many to come. So, appreciate it. Great. Thanks so much, Owen. Cheers. Thanks for watching this video on the RAS Network. While you're here, don't forget to like and subscribe so you can get videos each and every day on business, finance, investing, and so much more. Thank you.